word given and breathed out to us this morning, which says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. So the word of the Lord for us to equip us today. Let's pray and ask for his help. Father, we just pray to you this morning and ask that you will equip us by your word, that you will teach us, that your spirit will be at work in us, uh, equip us with your word, that we will know and we will play our part to advance the gospel. Um, help us to hear, to receive your word this morning and also to obey what you teach us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What we've got in this particular part of the chapter now is a is a like a turning point where we've turned, turned from the fact that Paul was giving this thanksgiving, making prayers with joy. He was uh, demonstrating the affection that he has for the church in Philippi, that he loves them, that he longs to see them, that he... Uh, praises God and gives thanks for them. That was his opening introduction. And there is a what we call a movement in the letter now. And this movement is towards teaching uh, and, and, and describing what has happened, which is to advance the gospel. Uh, that's where he is. So uh, the gospel advances. Now, let's just think generally. If, we were, if I was to put, you, uh, put that question to you this morning, and I said to you, how does the gospel advance? And also, what is, what is your role in that as, as, a, as a Christian? But how does the gospel advance? Well, maybe you might already be thinking of something like, well, I know the Great Commission, and I know that we are called uh, by Christ to go and make disciples of all people. So that's a, the all nations aspect of thinking of the Great Commission. You might have that in your mind. That it's actually a command that we have to obey. We're given the Great Commission. So you're, you may have that in mind of going and making disciples. Maybe you've got something in mind like Romans, Romans 10, right, where we talk about how is somebody going to believe unless they are preached to, right? You, you may have that kind of thing. Um, that is God's chosen method of bringing people to Christ is that people tell the Romans 1.16 news, which is the power of God for salvation, the gospel, right? Maybe you have that in mind, or maybe you were just thinking simply about well, I think we just all have a part to play in telling other people about what Christ has done, quite simply summarizing those in that way. But what we get in our passage today is additional information about how the gospel actually advances. Let's read again, 12, 13, and 14. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, so something's happened to Paul, has happened really serving, uh, sorry, really served to advance the gospel. What has happened to Paul has happened for the sake of the gospel going forward in the world. And he says in verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So he's very specific here. This is a prison letter. He's talking about his imprisonment and that this is for Christ. Verse 14, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So the gospel going uh, out as a result of this and Christians being strengthened, becoming more bold is what is taking place. So this is what's known as a, uh, I guess you could, it's a disclosure formula. There's a writing going on of a recent event that's happened and he's letting them know. Now, what do they already know? They know that he's in prison, right? There's already that desire, longing for Paul as he longs for them. They know, they have that information, but the additional information that they're getting now by, by hearing this is that this has a purpose. That's why he's writing this. He's saying it has a very specific purpose. My imprisonment, it's not just sad news, right? It's not just something bad has happened to us. 
It is taking place for a very specific reason, and that reason is for the advancement of the news of Christ's death and resurrection, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the news is simultaneously, we could say, sad news. But at the same time, it is also good news, and therefore thanksgiving must occur. God says to give thanks in all situations. So the Philippians themselves are to be like Paul. And even though they do miss him, they are to praise God for the imprisonment of Paul for what this is going, what this is achieving. Uh, now, I want to make a, a theological clarification with that to really point that out to you today. That Paul's update, it is not just, it is not just something to say, and I've heard this much when, uh, in, in previous years, where people might give a testimony about their life and coming to Christ. And that's always a beautiful thing to hear. But I would often hear this phrase or this kind of language, which was that my life was a mess, but then God made something beautiful out of the mess. Now, there's a truth to that, right? Because just in human looking, natural thinking, yes, my life was a mess and then God did do something beautiful. But there's a deeper biblical truth behind these things that while at the same time something bad happens, God uses all things according to his purposes. Amen. That, that's the way we think now because we, we believe the words of Scripture. We don't just put our own feelings and thoughts all in and around Scripture to kind of make it what we want it to be. We know that there are situations and all situations that, are, that happen, all events are for God's purposes. We're learning about his decrees even right now, right? Uh, a great place in scripture to remember this and understand is the story of Joseph where he has been sold into slavery. He has uh, gone to prison himself. His brothers had betrayed him and uh, Joseph's wording when he talks, when they come in, his brothers come in repentance of what they have done, realizing, wow, you're, you're still alive. Look, look at how God has, has used you. Um, they come in repentance but his words are so specific in this moment. He says, what you intended for evil, God meant for good. And you're never fully going to get your head around that. But did you hear it? What you meant for evil or intended for evil, God meant for good. Simultaneous. So th th these are those, those things that our human mind can't fully grasp, how there is something going on. But at the same time, there is another truth in God to be held on to tightly. And this is the same thing here where we can say, imprisonment of a Christian is sad and at the same time it is God's plan and purpose that's what Paul is demonstrating in the letter he hasn't said but hey guys something good is starting to come out of a bad situation he is saying right up front to us I am in prison for the gospel and it's it is a specific purpose being served here the gospel is advancing that's why I'm in prison uh, so God's plan for Paul to be in prison advance the news uh, of the gospel, if Paul had, let's think about this for a moment in, in, in Paul's context to maybe try and avoid prison. Maybe oh, there's a chance here that, that, that in these places, if I preach, I may end up in prison. So Paul could have decided to switch up the plan here. There's, there's a, there's a, we, we could have not had this letter in, in such a way if Paul's been think, his thinking was, well, hey, you know, we live in tough times where people don't really like the, the news of Jesus. So we've just got to sort of tone it down a little bit. Like maybe if he thought, rather than being a public Christian, where I just go forward to the marketplaces, to the synagogues, and I tell people wherever I go about Christ, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll do what the modern evangelicals are going to do a couple of thousand years. I'll just do the friendship evangelism stuff, right? I'll just, I'll just make it real nice, real simple, have some people over for dinner, and maybe there's an opportunity down the line to talk. That's not... That's not the biblical evangelism that we see here. No, the word of God has actually just obliterated Paul's worldly life. The word of God has come and captured his heart and he's completely sold out to Christ. See, Paul is locked up for gospel advance. And look, look at this next phrase that he gives us. So that it has become, this is the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest. He's seeing it. He understands it. God's sovereign plan and purpose here. It's gone public. Paul is an influential figure. The news has traveled of why he's locked up and the whole imperial guard and all the rest know about it. 
when you see this phrase, the imperial guard, you should have the, the elite guard in mind of the Romans, Caesar and Caesar's household in mind. Or we could say the news of Christ is reaching people in high places and it's making a stir. Christianity having landed, the gospel going out is causing a stir and as a result, more and more people are hearing of the news of what Christ has done. Um, it's, a, it's easy to imagine Paul in this situation of, of what it would look like. He's in there, he has a rotating shift of guards coming in, right? So one, one clock's on, he does his eight, ten, whatever hour shift he's doing. And in that time, he's just had all of that where he's been with Paul and he's just heard about the gospel of Christ. And then he clocks off and goes home and tells his family of the news that he heard from this, this guy in prison, this Paul, and, and what Christ has done. And then the next guards turn up. Paul just does it again. Tell you about Christ. You go home and tell your family. So it's going out and it's reaching. The news is traveling. And this is, this is the book of Acts all over, right? This is exactly what we see time and time again. We should remember here that he is locked up because he is a Bible-believing Christian. He is a Bible-obeying Christian. And I said, I think it was last week, that there's, a, there's an element to being a Christian, which is that not that you go looking for trouble, but by nature of being a Christian, there is trouble as a result. Uh, we could say you're godly troublemakers if you're truly living for Christ because you're just doing what the Bible tells you to do and it lands you in trouble sometimes, at times. Uh, so the statement here is, is what he says, is that my imprisonment is for Christ and he's, what he is saying is I am suffering for Christ. I am incarcerated for the risen king and this is advancing his message. Philippians is known as a, as a, as a prison letter uh, other ones are Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon, uh, understood as, as uh, prison letters also, because Paul uses this language of I am in chains for Christ. He uses this, uh, this phrasing to give us the understanding that he is, he is incarcerated, he is locked up. Now, to understand imprisonment in Paul's day is not simply serving time for a crime that has been committed as much as it is actually about awaiting your trial. So being in prison was like a holding place to find out what was going to become of you. And often it was execution. So I was really finding out, am I going to be killed here or will I get a little bit more time left? Right? That's, that's ultimately Paul's understanding. He's not sitting there necessarily keeping a calendar going, okay, I've got a two, three or a five year sentence. It's always a, an awaiting the verdict, awaiting what's going to be the outcome of this. And as we know, the end of Paul's life. From church history, we understand that Paul was eventually executed for the preaching of the gospel and the advancing of uh, the kingdom of God. What we should ask, though, is Paul in this situation, and we've already seen a little bit of it, how does he spend his prison time? Um, how does he await these verdicts? Well, we know that Paul prays and he sings in prison. He writes letters to encourage. We've got the prison letters. He teaches and strengthens the church with these letters that he writes and he, he leads people to Christ preaching the good news. We think of the Philippian jailer from Acts 16. Nothing really changes for Paul in prison apart from the comfort levels and the location. His missionary journeys are slowed, of course, but where Paul is placed, he just does the same thing. He prays, he sings to the Lord, and he tells people about what Christ has done. Um, we think about prison ministry today, and I've had some experience with that. There are similarities here, but also a very clear difference as well. Um, the Bible does say to remember those who are in prison. That's Hebrews 13.3. Remember those who are in prison. And I've seen that quoted a lot in terms of going and doing prison ministry, but that's about remembering the believers who are locked up for the gospel. That's a difference. So prison ministry is, is absolutely necessary, very very necessary to get the gospel in, but there's a difference of Paul's prison ministry versus I committed some crimes and I'm now locked up and there are people coming in to, to witness uh, uh, the good news. However, when we think of prison ministry, those same very things are going on in terms of taking the good news in, praying, advancing the gospel in the same way. I remember a, a documentary that I watched years ago of a convicted murderer uh, a very famous story, in fact, of a man who got involved in the occult and shortly after committed uh, terrible, terrible crimes of murder. And he was sentenced to life, 
yet he was given a Bible by an inmate and he read Psalm 34, 6. The poor, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him. And shortly after, as he received the gospel, he became a born again Christian. And as I was watching this documentary, what was most, what really stood out the most was they had images and photos of this man before his conversion to Christ. And you could literally see the evil in his eyes. You could see the way that this guy held himself and presented himself. And then in these later images, it actually had footage of him running Bible studies, singing songs with other inmates. And they were full of joy. And this man had been regenerated. He'd been born again of God. And so here was these, these same principles of what I was thinking about with Paul singing in prison. I was seeing going on today with somebody who was once a, 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 a murderer, now born again of God. I saw this difference and this demonstration and the prison ministry looking, looking similar in that sense. But different, of course, to Paul's reason, the mission of God continuing, he is locked up because he is a Christian who was telling other people about Christ. His very imprisonment, however, is for the fact that he was bold and unashamed of the gospel. That's the reality there. His sentencing was because he just was a teller of the truth. And that's what all Christians are ultimately called to be. Those who in our moment, when it's our time to be able to tell that we will do just like Paul did and tell the truth of the news of what Christ has done. Second, he says, now, as, as this gospel is advancing, he says, most of the brothers, having become much more confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are more bold to speak the word without fear. See, what, what's happening is as they're looking and seeing what Paul's happened, they've become strengthened. Now, now they're getting bold, right? Paul's so serious about this, this telling of the good news that he's in jail for it. I'm, I'm on board. This is serious. This is real. And friends, this is actually what takes place when persecution comes. Christians get more bold. In a very comfortable environment, we just get focused on our, on our stuff. We have a tendency to prioritize our own events and things that we might be interested in over the mission of God itself. Uh, in, in, a, in a, such a comfortable environment. And so... What Paul's demonstrating here is that he's locked up, but this is serving this purpose. Christians are actually getting really serious. They're getting really bold. They're getting really confident, and they're doing exactly the same thing. They're telling others of Christ. And we have to really just bring this into the, into the now in which we live and think about how serious are Christians today in the way that the Bible Christians are serious about the gospel advancing. Like, like, do our lives demonstrate that we are sold out to Jesus Christ and living for him? Or does our lives demonstrate that, you know, like I, I do a bit of Christian stuff when I can get to it. Like when there's not anything else that, that's taking precedence or, 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 or in, my interest. And I would have to say for the most part, and I'm, I'm sure you would agree with me, that Australian Christianity is so, so weak. That Australian Christianity is, is idle and it would have to even say that it's lukewarm. That it is convenient at best, and it truly is lukewarm Christianity that we see. We've got, we've got Bible uh, uh, theologians in Australia and uh, seminaries who teach us to, you know, prioritize, uh, uh, you know, going out and just doing our best to live as examples for Christ and, and no encouragement of, the, of the, the bold telling of Christ. That if the government rises up against, against the church, you back down, is ultimately the message that we saw during the years of COVID. You have to understand that that, that, that era that we saw of those, those co the COVID years, they were about the church, friends. Who is sovereign here? It isn't that God is sovereign over things concerning his people and COVID was a, a situation that was happening over to the side here. Like everything is under the sovereignty of God and the COVID years demonstrated that churches in Australia are weak, that Christians will bow down to the government if they are called to surrender and lay aside their beliefs and bow to the government. That's exactly what we saw. And, and, and there's a thing that's going on right now, and I'm not sure if you're bothered by it or not, but we're kind of pretending like all that stuff didn't happen. 
The churches and the universities themselves are kind of like, yeah, yeah, that was a tough time. Maybe at best, you might get a couple of these guys say things like, oh, we might, we might do things a little differently. No, you won't. If you were going to do things differently, you'd be repentant. You would actually be standing up saying, we got it wrong, folks, and we repent. Let this be a lesson to us that we will stand firm for Christ when such examples are, are, are before us again. Friends, may it not be so. May, may these warnings not just be, oh, okay, there's some interesting thoughts there, but may these be a reality that we grab a hold of. Friends, we're called to the gospel. Like if somebody is to put a gun in your face and say, you know, uh, Christ or, or death, you, 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 you're choosing Christ, right? If, if you are put in a situation where, where it's, it's either a clear difference between I go to prison or, or I denounce Christ and I say, yeah, I'm actually, I was just pretending. I'm not really a Christian. You go to, pri you go to prison, friend. That's what you do. You just think. And this is the, the whole concept of thinking like a Christian means that we think as the Bible speaks, right? We apply the words of the Bible to our brains and our thinking. And when somebody says something that's opposing the word of God, we speak what the Bible says. When they say things to us like, you can't worship God, you have to shut down your churches. We say, oh, well, Hebrews tells us that we aren't to forsake the gathering. So we say, sorry, you'll have to kill me, lock me up or do whatever you want, what you're going to do. But God's plans must prevail. Christ must be honored and lived for. The gospel it actually advances through these very things. I hope you're with me on this. We are called not to nice comfortable Australian Christianity. That's what, we've been, that's what we've been given for years and years and years. And many of you have been numbed by the reality of the type of Christianity that you've been presented over the years. Just numbing you and ultimately taking this gospel advancement down to a few principles, which is as a Christian, you need to pray, read your Bible and get to church when you can. As if that was the summary of what it meant to be a Christian. That's what you've been numbed by. You've been numbed by consumer Christianity, which has told you that you go to church to get your needs met, not ra rather than that, that you go to church to die for Christ. You go to church to give of yourself to others. You don't go to church whether it's convenient for you that week. You prioritize it because the mission of God is to advance. Yet we weigh it up. Will I go this week? Will I, will I give of myself this week? Will I, uh, does, it, does it suit my, my interests and do they have the right programs? We come to serve and advance the gospel of Jesus Christ for which he died. Friends, he loves this. He loves this so much that they killed him for this, right? He, he laid down his life and bled and gave up what he had in order that we would be his people. He laid down his life for the church. We are his bride and we are called to his purposes. May Christians in this country stop treating him as though he is just a life coach, just someone to pep us up when we need a little bit of prayer for our whatever it is that we've got going on or just a little, just, you know, a bit of faith that just helps me. May we actually be biblical Christians who are serious about advancing the gospel in this country. We need biblical Christianity once again. Look at this. Most of the brothers, having become much more confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are more bold to speak the word without fear. Does Australia need to get crushed in order for Christians to wake up? Does your comforts need to be snatched away from you in order that you will wake up and serve God? That's the sort of question we should ask. Are we just going to play games again this week? Play Christianity. We should wake up to the reality that Paul is suffering in chains for the gospel. And if we're truly living for him, there's going to be suffering. There's going to be a laying down of our lives. There's going to be a, a giving of our lives and everything for the sake of the good news advancing. And friends, it is so worth it. It is absolutely so worth it. I don't just want to give you a, a hard word this morning. The end result is the joy of the kingdom eternally, that you will live for God eternally. The joy is the fruit that comes and being a part of the mission of God. 
The, the, the future is joyful, it is glorious, and we cannot even cons- understand what God has prepared for those who love him. But the other result for the lukewarm Christian is you're not going to be there. You're not going to be there. If you're lukewarm, you're getting spat out of the mouth of Christ. And so if, you, if you're kind of lukewarm and you go like, yeah, I know I'm a bit lukewarm, but you're okay with that, now there's the problem. The problem is you being okay with being lukewarm. You're saying, I'm okay with hell. You're demonstrating you're you're a non-believer if that is the way that you feel about being lukewarm. If you are idle for the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's hell. You spat out of the mouth of the living God. So may we see scripture and obey scripture that there is no third way. There is no safe, soft middle ground. There is no such thing as me, Christianity, the lies that we've been presented with. There's no such thing as a, uh, just, a, you know, just trying to you know, develop my faith and, and, and walk out. It is biblical Christianity. Let's lay down our lives for Christ. Let's be emboldened by the reality and the truth of Scripture. Paul turns away now from the situation of the day. Look at verses 15 and 16. It says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. So he's he's just talked about two groups that exist in, in his situation here. There's two groups. One are preaching Christ, And their heart's intent behind it is that they're preaching Christ for the same purpose that Paul is. They're in love and they're in support of Paul. And there's another group who are doing it out of selfish ambition, from envy and rivalry. They have the same message. This is different than talking about false teachers now. We've done many passages before where we've talked about false teachers. This this is different, what we've got here. Uh, They are preaching the same Christ crucified. They're preaching the same gospel, but it's the heart's intent behind it that is different. One group out of love, one who are out of envy. The group that are doing it out of goodwill are easy to understand. That's easy to grasp. Fellow workers in the gospel, they've been ministered to by Paul. They understand their motives are, are the same. But then the others are Paul's enemies. And this is a little harder to grasp. He says in in verse 17, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, the same message, same details, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So these are the people that uh, Paul is, uh, talks about having enemies and people who are against him. They are preaching Christ, but their motive is directed at themselves. And there's not much more details here, but it's selfish ambition, right? It is... Uh, uh, understood then that they preach Christ for their own persona, their own status, to demonstrate that they are to be sought after rather than Paul. So again, the same articulation, but they're doing it because it's about themselves. They're using the ministry of the gospel for their own purposes. Um, like preaching uh, uh, to, to, to build up themselves and, and, and have a sense of importance in life and using the gospel of Jesus Christ in order to do so. So, are we simply Christians who are ministering because we see aspects of things that we get out of it? Or what is the heart intent behind when we tell somebody else about Christ? And this is a, just a great thing that we all have to, have, to, have to face. The good news about God is that he is so gracious to us. He is so gracious to us that even when there is mixed, mixed motives there, that, that, that maybe I maybe I preach in order that people go oh they, they you know people like me they like they like the preaching or something even when there is mixed motives but I was also preaching that 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 people be saved God is so gracious that He uses us despite ourselves and sanctification is so real that our motives will become pure as God continues to sanctify us we will continue to lay aside selfishness continue to lay aside those things which are not pure and righteous and and of him. But a passage like that does bring us to go, what do I, what do I do these various things for? Make sure that my heart is, is right and sincere. 
Am I happy that somebody gets saved and brought into the kingdom of God? If it wasn't me who got to have the conversation, that, that should be the celebration of all Christians. Of course, we want to be involved in those conversations. Hopefully, we want to be the ones that are there and engage with people and see those very things come and happen as a result. But we're equally joyful when somebody is, when we hear the news of somebody ministering the good news to somebody else as well. But of these people of Paul's day, we can say what they want to do here is they, they want to hurt Paul. They want to make things worse for him. They're doing this also, and part of this motivation is for, uh, for his affliction. To, to cause him to suffer more. They might come by, and this might come by the stirring up of the gospel again to raise awareness that, yeah, Paul is that troublemaker, or it could come through the fact that they are having a popularity and people are going to them rather than to Paul, whatever it is. But here is, here is where we land, and this is what Paul does as a result of this. You know what he says? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. In every way, regardless of the intention of their hearts, let Christ be proclaimed is where he lands up for us. If that's what your intention is, well, you're going to have to deal with that between you and God. But as Christ is exalted, well, I praise God that the name of Christ is lifted up. The, the, the truth of the, of the gospel being articulated. Why? Because Christ is true. Let him be proclaimed. Let him be exalted. Let Christ be preached because Christ is true and he saves sinners. He says, you guys are doing it for questionable reasons. But you know what? I'll rejoice anyway. Let Christ be proclaimed. And how is Christ proclaimed by his people who know him? How is he to be proclaimed by us who understand that the, the necessity of living a life that is devoted to the good news of Christ? Well, we know that he is the son of God. We know that he is the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. We are in affirmation of Isaiah 9, that for unto us a child was born. To those who were dwelling in great darkness, a even greater light has shone upon us. We know that he is the one whom the government is upon his shoulders. We know that he is the preeminent one of Colossians, the Alpha, the Omega, the one whom by which all things in the universe are held together. We know that in him all wisdom and knowledge is found. He is the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, whose very mission was to rescue his people from their sins. We know that he came for his own. He died the sinner's death that we deserve. He is the one who defeated man's greatest enemy, death. He defeated it when he walked out of that tomb. And he calls all of us who have ears to hear to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. He calls us to respond to what he has done in his death and resurrection by responding in repentance and in faith. That we would turn from our sins, be sorry for our sins, yes, but that we would put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. And the end result, if that is true and real in our hearts, if we have truly called upon his name, we'll be bearing fruit. It's just the, it's just the outworking of truly being born again. But let me be specific about that fruit as what we've looked at this morning. You will be a gospel proclaimer. You will be a person, part of the great commission of making disciples of all the nations. From the home, parents and little ones, from the work colleague to the next work colleague, from the neighbor to neighbor to the person, wherever they are, even inside the church, outside the church, that we are making disciples and there is a common message that we are proclaiming and telling, which is that Christ died for sinners in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That is our common message, and we proclaim it with our hearts. If you have not believed upon Christ, or if, if my words have stirred you today in terms of talking about the idleness or the lukewarmness of Christianity that we're currently seeing and experiencing, then there's a couple of simple things we can do here this morning. If it's brought to your attention that maybe I'm truly not in Christ, and there's a very simple truth to tell you this morning, you just need to believe upon Christ and be saved. That's the good news. Today, make, make it today, right? Don't, don't think, oh, that sounds like something I better make important before I die. Right? You, that's not how it works. Today is the day of salvation, the Lord says. So, so just believe upon Jesus Christ. Truly believe in your heart 
that he died for your sins and was raised to life. Repent of your sin. Second, if you are a lukewarm Christian and you recognize, yeah, I, I'm the very person who is probably going to get spat out of the mouth of God. Like I have to take that seriously. Like that's the word of God. And my, my, my walk with God, my, I'm going to be a Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, I didn't even know you. Because you were so idle, you were so lukewarm. I never even saw you. You weren't even there. But don't be that. Come today, hear this warning, hear this message of, of Scripture and call upon the Lord. Repent of lukewarmness. Repent of idleness. And join Paul. Join the mission of the church that's happening universally. Join the believers who are suffering for Christ. Make him known. Make him known. Will we ever suffer as much as most Christians? Don't know. Probably not. Maybe. Who knows, right? God is sovereign over that. But may we be faithful to the call of the gospel. Will you pray with me? I'm going to pray a prayer of repentance where we recognize that we have not been bold like those in scripture. Um, We're going to ask for God's grace and his kindness to us, but we're also going to ask that he strengthens us according to his word. Father in heaven, I just thank you this morning, Lord, that you have demonstrated to us that even suffering and affliction, that even imprisonment is there for a very specific purpose to advance the gospel. We saw that other Christians, as a result of seeing the affliction, then became bold. Lord, I actually just pray that we would be bold without having to suffer affliction. That would be the human path. We would, we would love that, Lord, to, to just be bold without having to be forced into a position where, where we have to start actually living for you. Uh, I pray that that would be our reality. That would be all of us, Lord. Um, that no matter where you send us, where you take us, we just live that way, Lord. From the home to the work to the, to the, to the street, wherever we are, Lord, we just live as Christians who are ready to tell others and advance the gospel. So we repent, Lord, of idleness, of lukewarmness. We repent of laziness, Lord, and we pray that you will give us the words that we need to proclaim the good news of Christ. Uh, May it be a great joy in our hearts, Lord, to be able to speak to others of what Christ has done. Embolden us today, Lord. Like Paul asked for prayer to be bold, may we also.